the only kind of revolution possible is a cultural one, simply to change the people in control of parliament or of the means of production is no revolution, it's a coup d'etat. And that's a quote from Dr. Jim Cairns. In fact, it's the opening quote of a 1980 exam paper set by Donald Horne for a course on Australian political culture. Across barely a dozen questions, Donald Horne quotes Jim Cairns and Antonio Gramsci and Robert Menzies and Dennis Altman and Keith Hancock, amongst so many others. In three hours, political science undergraduates at the University of New South Wales were invited to consider the theory of hegemony, Australia as a home-owning democracy, Australia as a derivative culture, the monarchy as a bastion of conservatism. The man who set this exam had no tertiary qualifications. Before he took up lecturing, in fact, he spent most of his professional life as a journalist and an editor working for Sir Frank Packer. He was once known for his fierce anti-communism, his co-editorship of Quadrant, uh, and for his book, The Lucky Country, that damned the nation's elites as second rate. For a long time, Donald Horne suspected that there could be no role for public intellectuals in Australia. Indeed, intellectual was a European term, ill-suited for an egalitarian nation. When it appeared in one publication that Horne edited, intellectual was always surrounded by quotation marks. Yet the much older Donald Horne who set this exam paper had learned from experience that ideas can travel if they're articulated clearly and if they're presented as part of a conversation, that intellectuals, and I quote, give shape to inchoate ideas already agitating the public mind. So this lecture is a chance to explore how Donald Horne came to embrace and to some extent to shape the category of public intellectual in Australia. This was only in his later years a conscious effort. The young Donald imagined his destiny as a poet or a novelist, and his middle years were focused on journalism. It took the unexpected success of his first published book, which was written at the age of 43, before Horne began to speak in public about ideas. And even this later public Donald Horne was rarely a systematic thinker. His early training made him very suspicious of, of epistemological claims. Only the late blooming Donald Horne strived to capture and order the ideas that had preoccupied him for many years, shaped by the fundamental question of how culture is formed and sustained. And that's where I'm going to go. I want to contend that Donald Horne's life of a public intellectual, or life as a public intellectual, developed as a response to his experience, that the thinking arose from the life. Horne observed his world very closely and he drew from his examination broad lessons about how to live and what to value. He captured these thoughts in a, an apparently endless series of diary notes uh, and these informed subsequently a series of autobiographical volumes. Uh, Steve Garten, um, who's the Dean of Arts at the University of Sydney, but also Donald Horne's son-in-law, tells me there are 114 boxes of unsorted materials at the Mitchell Library. This was a man who took a lot of notes and kept them. Uh, and each, each of the books that he distilled from those notes chronicles a phase of his life and reading, his conversations, his friends, his public and his, pro and his political passions. I suspect it's this richness of primary material that's discouraged anyone from writing an auto a biography of Donald Horne because there's none available. In fact, there's a remarkably little secondary literature either touching on his life and writing. But his own writing, which is voluminous, offers the self-portrait of an intellectual who, as he observed, is at his worst when illogical, but at his very best when curiosity and scepticism make him question received wisdom. I want to suggest in the next little while that there are four phases in, of development in his thinking. The first is the early enthusiasms of the student years, shaped by philosopher John Anderson. The second is a long period as a journalist and an editor associated principally with the causes of the political right. The third, a shift in middle age to an interest in how culture is formed and sustained and then final decades unexpectedly committed to political activism around issues of democracy and representation. It's an unusual journey. There are some continuities in this life. 
Horn's libertarian beliefs, for example, and his sceptical view of the state is a, remains constant. But there are also significant shifts. The most important is that the recognition, the value of public conversation in shaping culture. This optimism, this late optimism, makes it very hard to simply describe Donald Horn in conventional political terms as someone who started on the right and ended on the left. It's actually someone who came very slowly to a view about the role of ideas in our society and what they make possible, which is why I suggest that the journey and the thinking are as one. Well, let me start with young Donald. Born in Sydney, 1921, the eldest child, the only son of a great war veteran turned school teacher and a mother who put aside work for family. In his, later on, Donald Horn could remember his earliest years with astonishing detail. He could evoke the buildings and the families of his early family life in Musselbrook in the Hunter Valley, the, shell, the books on the shelves, the social structure of the town with all its fine gradations of status and influence. When his father transferred to a school in Sydney, the Horn family moved to his grandmother's house in Cogra. It was a caring family, but hard pressed financially, and it was a very lonely life for a, a, a talkative boy who had no siblings until he was a teenager and very few opportunities to discuss the books that he loved. Donald Horn completed his secondary schooling at Canterbury High, the same school attended a couple of decades later by John Howard. By then, Donald Horn had found a new enthusiasm, the lively campaigns of the Daily Telegraph, owned and run by Frank Packer. The Daily Telegraph spoke profoundly to Horn's desire for modernity. Horn, and I quote him, fell in love with it from the first issue, its contemporary voice, the rebelliousness of spirit, this newspaper of firm opinions. Horn would spend much of his professional life as a journalist and editor working for Frank Packer, he found in the Daily Telegraph a voice that matched his own character, optimistic, impatient with artifice, allied to the new, occasionally brash. But first, it was time for university. On finishing school, Horn enrolled in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Sydney on a teacher's college scholarship, which ensured that he would follow his father's profession. He arrived on campus at the start of 1939, aged just 17, absolutely thrilled to be at university. But he quickly discovered the gap between his background, his modest background, and the many very privileged students at the University of Sydney. He found himself dissembling about his family origins. He taught himself new diphthongs from, the, from an English textbook to try and modify his accent. And, and in some senses, this is the first of a number of reinventions. He also quickly discovered that life in the quad talking to other students was much more rewarding than time in the classroom being lectured. Unlike many students, he was swept away by each new discovery, and he used them to try on a series of identities for himself. So at various times, he was a poet, a follower of aesthetics, a psychologist, a follower of Freud, a scientist, an artist, a laconic conversationalist, or as he called himself, young Donald, mumbler of witticisms. Donald seemed determined to test himself against the most challenging ideas he could find on campus. And he found these ideas personified in the most famous man at the University of Sydney, the Chalice Professor of Philosophy, John Anderson. Anderson, Horn re recalls, and this is a longish quote, was the university's main rebel, a renowned atheist, not long ago a communist, censored in the New South Wales Parliament and by the University Senate, he was in his 40s, very tall, stooped, gangling, striding loosely past in a brown suit and green hat with an upturned brim, usually sombre with his pipe jutting out from beneath his teeth. He seemed an embodiment of all that was grave and constant in human suffering. But sometimes, sometimes he would wave an arm at a student, loosely as if it were a puppet's, and smile, strong teeth bursting beneath his full black moustache. Recognition, sunshine. I was gripped by the need to know him, said Donald Horn. In fact, Horn began attending literary society meetings with Anderson in the chair. The professor's papers were heard in reverent silence. It took only an hour, recalled Horn, but we felt that we'd just witnessed an important new contribution to the theory of aesthetics. Horn worked hard 
to imitate the argumentative style favoured by Anderson and his many acolytes on campus. But he found it pretty difficult to capture the essence of Andersonian thought. This is not surprising, for the chalice professor of philosophy was reworking his position at a rate of knots. During the 1930s, this one decade alone, he'd been associated with the Communist Party, then briefly a Trotskyite, before he'd broken with organised Marxism and embraced a libertarian position. No wonder it was difficult to capture the nuances of where he was coming from. So this latest incarnation, this libertarian Anderson, pitted the professor in opposition to all authoritarian states and institutions, including almost all the formal requirements of university life. Anderson, in fact, eventually rejected all political ideals and labels and any belief in meaningful change through political action. He turned instead to the the work of the rest of his life exposing the illusions of progress. And his vehicle for doing so, in part at least, was the Sydney University Three Fort Society, which for a while welcomed D.R. Horne as secretary. It can be very hard from a distance to grasp what makes any teacher charismatic. But Anderson's striking influence on generations of students clearly attests to an extraordinary magnetism. When Anderson spoke, and I quote, in his urgent Glaswegian, Glaswegian sing-song, the room seemed stilled with significance, reports Horn. He was thrilled by Anderson's implacable lack of compromise and the way he argued stubbornly and passionately against almost everything said by anyone, apart, of course, from the three thinkers at Sydney University. Anderson appeared to the admiring young student an intransigent believer in the exposure of all illusions and a prophet of the ideal of a life lived in permanent protest. The philosopher could seem entire and sufficient unto himself, a lofty figure who, quote, had lost interest in the intellectual world outside Sydney, apart from sometimes sneering at what was going on in Melbourne. End quote. Anderson's influence on young Donald would be primarily political, and it would run counter to Donald Horne's personality. As Horne later grasped, he was by temperament an optimist, but his intellectual training made him a pessimist. He took from Anderson an understanding that a free thinker should attack both the left and the right in politics, and Horne would go on doing so enthusiastically for decades to come. But I suspect Anderson also reinforced an underlying conservatism in Horne's outlook, a sense that people cannot influence their surroundings, which are shaped by social forces rather than individual agency. Hence, Horn took in the lesson, trying to reform society is doomed to failure. One must account for things, not trying to change them, as Horn summarised quad discussions amongst the Andersonians. In particular, Horn took on board Anderson's concern about unintended consequences, his assertion that any attempt at social improvement produces results that undermine the the intention. And this insight justified Horn in rejecting, for example, all labour politics as meliorist and misguided. He preferred a view of himself as a radical conservative. In the Andersonian spirit, uh, Horn did not register to vote, and he delighted in attacking welfare and planning as a student and later as a journalist. Yet maintaining this lofty detachment from life was never going to be Donald Horne's most plausible persona. He was, by every instinct, an activist. So even while professing Andersonian views about the futility of individual agency, the undergraduate Horne embraced student and literary life with gusto. He had several attempts at breaking into student politics unsuccessfully, and then he found a home in the student newspaper on Issoir. He loved the intimacy of journalism. I could think of some new thing on the tram on the way to the university and minutes later I could hurry to the Onisoir office and start doing it, he said. Horn realised a sense of purpose and achievement through journalism and through student politics. However trivial a source of power, he decided later, student politics can provide the same pleasures as the greatest office. This was my education, he said. Finally, the politically activist Donald Horne symbolically slayed the father. He organised enough votes to depose Anderson as president of the Literary Society and get himself elected as leader instead. 
He felt guilty about this for years to follow. He clearly remained enthralled by Anderson's ideas and he judged all his own actions as quite inadequate against Anderson's more austere standards. The natural optimist battled the learned pessimist. The public Donald Horne criticised planning and all the illusions of reform while the private man wondered whether the world was really quite as it had been presented in the lecture theatre. In early 1942, Donald Horne's university career was cut short by conscription. He found himself first in the regular army and then in the artillery. Horne, it would be fair to say, was not a natural soldier, though his usual powers of observation produced a fine running commentary on the social structure, organisation and follies of the Australian military, which he shared with his university friend, the poet James Macaulay. The army gave Donald Horne time to read new British literary magazines such as Horizon and Scrutiny and to discover The Economist, which he described as his first encounter with serious journalism. This included reading about Asia, and in 1944, Horne applied to be amongst the first intake into the new Australian diplomatic corps. He was accepted, he left the army with relief, and he moved to the Canberra University College, then a part of the University of Melbourne, to train for overseas service. Thus, the opponent of planning found himself recruited to a public service committed to reconstructing post-war Australia. Horne did not like being a soldier, and in truth, he fared little better as a trainee diplomat. In the long college holidays, he began supplementing his cadet pay by writing for the Daily Telegraph. Indeed, he started commuting back to Sydney at every opportunity and avoiding Canberra. At the Daily Telegraph, Horne relished the world of reporters. His successor, as on his soi editor, Murray Sale, taught him the house style, the art of journalism in which the mysteries of existence would freeze into a few short, sharp and solid sentences. Journalism meant making the world understandable for readers. It was teaching of a sort, a way to communicate with an imagined audience. So in 1945, Horne quit public service for journalism, an apartment in King's Cross and the Daily Telegraph newsroom. He covered politics and city news. He met legendary newspaper men in hotels. He was excited and disappointed in love. And he developed an enduring fascination with the court politics around his employer. He lived, in short, the life of a journalist completely engrossed in his work, skilled at his craft, at home in the heavy drinking male culture of newspapers, spending his income on books and taxis and restaurants. Many of his most memorable anecdotes from this period revolve around political arguments at parties. Horne found himself a conservative in a profession usually peopled by the left. He was out of sympathy with the era of post-war reconstruction, quoting Hayek or The Economist to, to bemused fellow journalists. To be an anti-Stalinist intellectual as late in history as 1947, he recalled, seemed a gallant and lonely stand. He could find little comfort or support amongst his fellow Andersonians. They had split into rival camps, as they would go on doing for decades to follow. Some upheld the writings of the present John Anderson, while others denounced the philosopher as reactionary, preferring the earlier, truer Andersonianism. This would continue. And yet, it wasn't just about journalism. Even as a young journalist, Horne nurtured more than more um, literary ambitions. And I quote, reminders that I was now aged 27 and had not yet written even one novel could strike me momentarily senseless with disbelief, he said. So in 1948, he married Ethel, an Englishwoman living in Sydney, and he set sail for the United Kingdom and a new life as a novelist. With his new bride, he settled into an English village, became active in the local Conservative Party, and began writing. Alas, being a novelist was not a success. Publication proved elusive, and Horne resumed journalism as funds ran short. He first moved to London and the Fleet Street Bureau of the Sydney Sun, which was, uh, I suspect gallingly for him, run by fellow novelist George Johnson before returning to the Packer stable. He was eventually recalled to Sydney and he returned without Ethel. The marriage, already failing, fell apart, quote, in an unexpected exchange of letters, end quote. 
Arriving home from the United Kingdom was a shock. And I quote, all of Sydney seemed second rate and run down. I saw myself as an exile from the old world, itself shabby, but with a shabbiness rich in meaning. Australia was mindless, I would say to myself. Where were the art museums and theatres? Where was the intellectual debate? Horn resolved to start a, a journal of ideas, to create in Australia the sort of reading he'd enjoyed in Britain. But first he must learn to be an editor, leading a new publication with, frankly, the less than promising title of Weekend Australia's Brightest Newspaper. Horn proved a quick study, but also a rather quixotic editor. He was generous at times and monstrous at others. Unhappy with the quality of one article produced for Weekend, he tore up the typed copy and threw it out the window. He became notorious for his technique in sacking people when he'd lose his temper to give himself courage. The very male and alcohol fueled culture of journalism made such incidents the stuff of barroom legend. The brother of one sacked employee poured a glass of beer over the weekend editor in a local hotel. Horn would look back on these incidents with deep embarrassment and he'd later changed quite profoundly his approach to working with the team. Professional success, and he achieved that quickly, did not produce personal happiness. Now in his mid-30s, and still with no published novel, Horn worried about his life editing Australia's brightest newspaper and acting as court jester to Frank Packer. There were periods of depression and doubt for D.R. Horn, the, quote, angry, ill-informed shouter who saw himself as a failed novelist consumed by alcohol, rage and self-pity. And in political terms, the world was taking disturbing and unexpected turns, as communism became the defining issue of the 1950s. Old friends, such as James Macaulay, began to describe themselves as anti-communist intellectuals and help establish organisations such as the Australian Council, Australian Committee for Cultural Freedom to publish a new journal, Quadrant. Many fellow Andersonians followed Macaulay's lead, though others declared themselves libertarians and became, in time and for a generation, the Sydney Push. Horn could not identify with the Push. He disliked its anti-intellectual culture and its romantic playing with anarchism. He would join Macaulay instead, and for the next 15 or more years, he would work in the cause of anti-communism. But as Horn pondered his political stance, two important changes in his life would define the path ahead. The first was personal. He met Mafani Golan, a journalist with the Sydney Morning Herald, who, like Horn, had learned her craft on his soir. They married in 1960, and their close partnership would endure until Horn's death 45 years later. Second was the opportunity at last to edit an intellectual journal. Horn had long believed that there was an audience for ideas in Australia, despite the paucity of serious books and journals about Australian life. Indeed, as he noted, in the 1950s, the number of foreign books banned each year in Australia was greater than the number of books published. But in 1958, Frank Packer agreed to underwrite the fortnightly Observer, with academic commentary on local and international affairs, and writers such as Michael Bohm and Robert Hughes and Bob Raymond and Bruce Beresford and Les Tanner and Des O'Grady. Through the, journals of a, through the pages of a journal that Horn described as, quote, intelligently conservative, end quote, he developed the topics and the themes he would later publish as The Lucky Country. To assist with the new journal, Horn hired Peter Coleman, a student of both John Anderson and the English philosopher Michael Oakeshott. Coleman and Horn would work together on a series of projects, often providing space for fellow anti-communists. There was a further significant change in this period, and it took a long time to play out, but it went to the core of Horn's long-standing political beliefs. As a good Andersonian, Horn remained sceptical about the prospects for meaningful reform through the political process. So despite considerable personal misgivings, he judged it pointless to attack the white Australia policy. Australian folk roots, he observed, quote, are in many ways amongst the most reactionary and racially bigoted in the world. The prevailing culture argues for a realist approach because there was not yet a chance of surmounting the prejudices of the Australian people. And the editor decided, given that worldview, 
that the observer would not press the issue of institutionalised racism in Australia's migration policy. But not everybody shared this view, this pessimistic view, about the limits of political action. And Horn later observed, and I'll quote it at some length, a year after the observer got going, 20 or so young intellectuals, mostly from the University of Melbourne, began meeting in a suburban house in Camberwell to discuss the practicalities of reforming the white Australian immigration policy. In the liberal intellectual tradition, they decided to publish a pamphlet. It expressed conservatively, but it was in a new way of looking at the practical chances of amending what was seen as one of the foundations of both the Australian state and Australian society. And in only a few years, it had practical effects, much bigger than those expected. As good intellectuals, they were negotiating part of the new sense of the possible in Australia. The campaign, of course, proved historic and influential. By, 1990, by 1966, the Commonwealth Government abandoned racial criteria when assessing potential migrants. This was a revelation for Donald Horne. It called into question his assumption that social progress must always be an illusion. It seemed to demonstrate clearly that intellectuals could organise, they could frame campaigns, they could challenge foundational tenets of the Australian settlement. Donald Horne, the pessimist, carefully schooled in realism by Anderson and a host of books, glimpsed the possibility of Donald Horne, the optimist, who could see that culture is not always immutable, nor politics necessarily ineffectual. Horn had always held us true that reform will be overwhelmed by unintended consequences, but now he grasped the risk of inaction, that failing to act might also be harmful. Marrying, editing The Observer and watching a successful political campaign all encouraged Horn to rethink his understanding of the world. And he came to a view that ideas could matter, that change was possible, and this could be led by people, doing one of the things only intellectuals can do, here I quote, good, bad or indifferent, they were providing new concepts of what was going on, new concepts of what could go on, despite myself, said Donald Horne, I was an intellectual, if not in quotation marks. <laughs> 